Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Biggs. I'm Congressman from Arizona's 5th Congressional District, and I'm joined uh, by a great guest tonight, and, and I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Ilan Warman is a, a law professor at ASU, but he's all, more than that, he's also the plaintiff's attorney in a lawsuit representing a hundred some odd uh, bars who have been uh, discriminated against by the lockdown issued by the governor. And and we've, we've, we've interviewed Elon before, and now we're going to catch back up about what's going on. And first of all, how, it seems to me like you were at 40 or 50 this last time we talked. How many plaintiffs do you have in the case now? Uh, we're at 130 now. And the big reason for that is because on August 10, the Arizona Department of Health Services promulgated guidelines that make it virtually impossible for many bars to open, right? The positivity rates have to hit below 3%. In some counties, they're finally just approaching 3%, uh, but they're going to go up again. And, you know, then we're just going to be back to square one. And even then they can only open with restrictions. So since August 10, we've had just an absolute flood of new uh, plaintiffs joining the lawsuit. It almost seems like a whipsaw. So if you have this a, a generic um, aggregate uh, a metric that, that you, you can whipsaw between open and close because that you, it's nothing you guys can control. None of your clients can control that. that, that that's right. And, you know, lots of other factors go into it, the positivity rates. And I'll just name two things. You know, how many people get tested? If only 10 people get tested and one test positive, you know, then, oh, you're 10% positivity, barely on the margin of, of moderate. And then yeah. look, we all know that coronavirus cases skyrocketed last summer, partly, if not largely, but certainly partly in part of uh, because of the protests that were going on. Well, guess what I saw this week as I was coming home uh, just an hour ago uh, from the gym that's finally open and I can finally go again. There was a new protest. Uh, because of the events that, you know, the tragic events uh, of the last week in, in Wisconsin. So we're going to have another set of protests. And who's going to get blamed the next time the numbers go up? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's the, kind the, of an the interesting, bars. yeah, it's an interesting thing that, that the bars are going to be the pinata that, that they're, they're swinging at. Um, I don't know if you saw this, but there's some new CDC guidelines, uh, some guidance out with regard to uh, not testing people who are asymptomatic. Uh, and, and, but we're not in, we're not following that guideline in Arizona, right? So, so people are getting tested anyway. So it's very interesting to see. So you guys, you filed for a temporary restraining order or an, or some kind of injunctive relief, right? Yeah. So remember originally to those who didn't join us last time, we filed the petition directly in the Supreme court of Arizona. We made these legal arguments about the non-delegation doctrine, right? Who exercises legislative power? The governor can't be a lawmaker. And we also made a non-discrimination argument on the basis of the state privileges or immunities clause. Well, the Supreme court uh, yesterday at 4 30 PM declined to exercise their discretionary jurisdiction to hear our case uh, because again, we skipped the trial court and so on. And what they said is, you know, we really would like to see factual development of the discrimination claim. So basically they're saying, please just go back to superior court. We're not uninterested in these issues. So at 4.30, that order came in. At 4.55 p.m., I filed a new complaint in Maricopa County Superior Court. We were obviously ready for that uh, eventuality. And we filed for a preliminary injunction. And there is a hearing set uh, in front of Judge Pamela Gates uh, on Friday of next week, uh, September 4. Uh, and so we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it becomes a, a timing issue, though. I mean, because every week you go longer, small business operators and, and some of our, your bars are going to be small business operators. They come that much closer to being unable to reopen even if they get authority to reopen. That's right. And that's why we think we're eligible for a preliminary relief, right? For a temporary restraining order or preliminary uh, injunctive relief, precisely because the harm is about to be irreparable. Look, when we filed this case in the Supreme Court in July, they had a few months of cash reserves. They could hang on for a few months. Uh, we thought the orders might expire, but they haven't been expired. You know, we, we've got wine bars, so, you know, single woman owned uh, small business that has been closed for four months of the year. They've got weeks left of cash reserves, weeks, that's it. And so this is our last chance. If we lose this preliminary injunction, that's it. We, there's no more opportunity for quick relief. Uh, we just wait for the case uh, to play out on the normal litigation timeline, and we're gonna see businesses go out of business, uh, all because they're, they're a scapegoat. 
Yeah, no, no, that's right. And, and so some of the evidence that you have, I mean, a lot of people don't realize how many um, classifications of a uh, bars and uh, an alcohol, some kind of alcohol distrib- distribution that we have in Arizona. But, uh, you know, we've heard everything from if you're in a, in a hotel and you have that kind of a, a, a bar, you can be open. If you're a uh, bar attached to a restaurant, you can be open. But if you're a straight bar, you can't be open. Tell us about the distinctions here and, and then also some of the evidence that you have uh, with regard to, say, a restaurant, some of these uh, Series 12 restaurants, which are uh, something altogether different. Yeah, just to be clear, there is no such thing as a straight up bar. A bar is a bar is a bar is a bar. Hotels have bars and they're called series 11. Restaurants have bars, quote unquote restaurants. They're just series 12. Wineries have bars, distilleries have bars, private clubs. When did you last go to your country club or to the Moose Lodge with karaoke night on you know Thursday night or Friday night, right? They have bars, they all have bars. Bars are open in Arizona, 5,000 of them. It's only a subset of bars that have been closed down, they've been unfairly targeted because the governor wants a scapegoat. What is the distinction between the series sixes, my clients that are closed and series 12 quote unquote restaurants that are open? The only legal distinction is that series six licensees don't have to have a minimum 40% food sales. They just don't have to prove that. Now many, and, and the other legal distinction is that they can sell alcohol to go. That's their right. That's a privilege that they paid for. Well, many restaurants have Series 6 licenses so they can sell alcohol to go when they sell food to go. Many uh, Series 6 licensees have more than 40% food sales. They just want the flexibility to not you know, get audited by the Department of Liquor you know, every year. Uh, I have a client, Series 6 licensee, called Firestone Pizza. Why is he closed? But Pizza Hut with a Series 12 liquor license is open. Right? A bar is a bar is a bar. The distinction between series six and seven, it's a legal distinction that has absolutely nothing to do with the public health. So to answer your second question, on the evidence that we've amassed and we filed in this 283 page complaint with exhibits, we have video evidence of a series 12, quote unquote restaurants, that is a nightclub. It's a nightclub, loud music, DJ, dancing out in Tucson. It's Union Public House and Reforma, if, if anybody you know knows down there. It was like on August, 12 or something, or August 8, all my clients closed down because of this fear of karaoke and live music and dancing and clubbing. Clubs are still open. We have evidence of several Series 12s and private clubs, Series 14s, advertising karaoke nights. Karaoke is specifically prohibited by the guidelines that are going to be applicable to my clients when they can open. Well, karaoke is still happening. Again, the point is series the Series 6 and 7 distinction versus Series 12 simply doesn't track what the governor is trying to accomplish. It's totally arbitrary. It's totally unfair. And I'd like to think that the governor just didn't know what he was doing. That he just didn't know enough about liquor law. I mean, that, that's, that's the best interpretation. That's the most hopeful interpretation. And, and I'm hoping he takes another look at it. You know, if he wants to say no dancing, fine. If he wants to say no karaoke or you've got to close by 10, fine, but apply it to your friends in the restaurant industry because only then would it be a constitutional public health measure. It really is an interesting thing. Um, it, 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 what you describe is, is like, we're going to legislate against any fun. That's, that's, I just have to say that. And, and uh, you guys apparently, uh, have, it, it, for whatever reason, seem to have a more observable amount of fun, although there's plenty of observable fun going on which is another way of saying evidence of normal bar activity elsewhere, right? Again, (laughs) if they wanted to say no fun, fine. But the Series 12s are having fun. The Series 3s, the Series 11s, the Series 13, the Series 14, the Series 18, the 19s, they're all having fun. Again, a bar is a bar is a bar. It has nothing to do with whether you can have karaoke night, whether you can implement public safety measures. It's just simply unconnected. It's, it's a lazy distinction or it's a distinction that's just based on not knowing what the licensing scheme is. And, and that's what's so sad. I mean, that's pretty charitable. I, I, I just, of, of you, I think that you're being pretty charitable. I, I'm struggling to understand how they could, but, but I'm struggling how, how, how to understand how they <laughs> can do this kind of, of, of uh, restriction when it doesn't seem to have any connection whatsoever to public health, your stated public health goals. And, and, but it isn't just with bars. I mean, this has happened across the board 
in all kinds of industries. I mean, I was just talking to folks for water parks. I mean, I've talked to, to people with gyms. Uh, you know, there's 1,100 gyms and, and uh, they've allowed 100 to reopen, but not others. And, and nobody, whether you're open or not open, can tell you, well, we don't know why, why we're open or we're not, why we're not allowed to be open. It's just willy nilly. And, and, and my, back in my law school days, I think we would have called that something like arbitrary and capricious. And well, that's that, yeah, that's, that's right. This is an administrative law problem. What they've done yeah. is they made these hard metrics, these metrics that are really tough to meet, like the positivity rates go down 10%, which they're maybe finally going down this Thursday, tomorrow. They think it'll finally hit the two-week window. But for a long time, they didn't. You got to do 3%, you know, if you don't serve food, right? But then they had a form that you could fill out that if your county doesn't meet the rates, well, maybe we'll let you open if you file this application with us and attest to all these extra things you do. And so instead, they're just letting random people stay you know, open on the basis of no apparent standards or guidance at all. And they're letting, you know, funny enough, most of my clients keep getting rejected. I wonder why that is, you know? I mean, that's, that's an administrative law problem. That's a discretion problem. There's no guidance. There's no regulation to actually guide their discretion. So, so it's totally up to them and it's a black box. It's totally right. a black box. Craziness, craziness. Now, you've, you've, I think you might've added, added maybe a damages claim based on a, 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 a regulatory taking type of argument. Explain what a regulatory taking argument would be uh, and how you get damages um, and how they actually measure those damages. Yeah, so um, we've, we talked last time a bit about what a taking is and to the uninitiated, you know, the taking is when the government takes property, usually physical property, for a public purpose, it has to pay just compensation. So the classic example, as you know, is if they want to build a highway that goes through your house, they can take down your house without your consent uh, because it's a public purpose, but they have to pay you just compensation. Uh, a regulatory taking is different. It's when the, uh, the government passes regulations that almost totally take away the value of your property. Now, most people, right, I mean, you operate a business, you're subject to future changes in the regulatory environment, future changes that affect, you know, the value of your business. But if it's like a total deprivation and it's a, a piece of property, then you state a claim for a regulatory taking. Most businesses can't state a regulatory takings claim. The right to operate a business is liberty. It's not a property. You don't have a property right. You have a property right in your gym equipment, but you can sell your gym equipment and make the money back, right? Series six and seven licensees though are special. Their licenses are actually property rights. You can buy them, you can sell them, you can transfer them, you can inherit them. The going rate for a series six license was $135,000 in Maricopa County before the pandemic. Why, why are these property rights? Because uh, they're a quota, they're a quota license. The number of series sixes that the state can issue is fixed by law and it only changes every 10 years according to population. So it's actually a property right. I have at least two clients who inherited their, their series oh. six licenses. So it's actually a property right. And we're arguing that for a temporary period, I mean, it's ongoing now, but whenever it ends, it will have been obviously a temporary period. They've basically had a total deprivation of the value of that license. And so we measure it by the value that the, you know, the, the best obvious way to, to, to evaluate a temporary taking is the loss of profits, right? That's how we think uh, we could measure it. So in a sense, my plaintiffs are lucky. I mean, they're unlucky since they've been targeted but they're lucky in the sense that they have a property right. And that's how they can make this uh, regulatory takings argument. Wow. So, I, I mean, I love that. That's a, that's a, that's a great legal discussion. Uh, uh, and what the nub of it is for the, for the folks who aren't lawyers is they have a property interest. It is essentially uh, tantamount to any other property that you might own that, which might be condemned or taken by the state. And if, if they take it, you're entitled to compensation. And the question is, only at that point, should be only how do you how do you uh, calculate the compensation due to your to your client, uh, the people who were subject to the regulatory taking. So yeah, it, it, exactly. And look, the test for regulatory takings it's it's a kind of a nightmare. It's it's like very Breyer esque, Kennedy esque. They wrote all these opinions. It's multi part tests, you know, with with multiple prongs and so on. 
And one of the questions in a regulatory takings case uh, is the character of the government action and who should bear the burden? Should it be allocated among the public? And look, if this is unconstitutional, if this is arbitrary discrimination, then surely the loss should be distributed among the public and at least the Series 12 licensees who have profited from basically taking all the patrons that would otherwise go to my clients, you know, now go to, you think they're not still drinking? Of course they're still drinking. They're just going to the hotels on the weekend or they're going to, to you know, a Series 12 that turns into a nightclub, right? And so who should bear the burden here? Why should an, a group that's scapegoated, that's unfairly discriminated against, bear the whole loss uh, 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 of, you know, the, bear the whole burden here? Uh, and so we think we have a, a good regulatory takings analysis. Well, and that, I would assume the regulatory taking is going to go much longer than the uh, injunctive relief uh, question. So, yeah, we're, we're, we're hoping to, I mean, I'm hoping to bifurcate the case. Look, at the end of the day, we want to open. We want to open because because there's no guarantee in, in litigation. We want to open. They want to earn a living. They want to work. And then we'll deal with the damage that's been done. Okay? We don't want to just take on forever and ever and ever, and then maybe we get damages, maybe we don't. That's really not the point. The point here is to let them open up. And then we'll go back and evaluate, you know, kind of the damage done and if we can recover for it. But so, so we hope that the injunctive part of this case moves fast. Yeah, me too. And um, I think it's already been a long time coming. And so... Ilan Werman, uh, ASU law professor, but also uh, champion in this corner for the bars that want to open up uh, that have been uh, singled out to be remain closed while other uh, bars have been allowed to open. Thanks for what you're, what you're doing. I appreciate it. Thanks for taking some time uh, when you got to be getting busy to, to go in uh, on Friday uh, to deal with this. And, uh, you know, Godspeed to you. I mean, you're doing, you're doing an important work, I think. So thanks, thanks. so much. And Thanks for your interest in the story. Yeah, absolutely.